Block, helping you with Acorn and Riscos computing. Okay, 7.45. So tonight's guest speaker is Chris Hall, who is in Bristol. Um, and, uh, well, he's going to talk about several different topics. So I'll let him explain. So, yeah, Ruth will mute everyone. You might have to unmute yourself, Chris, after that. So, Chris, you'll need to unmute yourself. If he's in Bristol, does he going to talk like I do, my dear? Oh, I'm not a Bristolian. I've only been here uh, since 1990. Oh, I'm from Bath anyway. <laughs> Just a little... Right, well, let me see. Right, I've, you should be able to see um, the dreaded PowerPoint slide. Uh, with me as a little thumbnail somewhere. Is that uh, um, correct, Ruth? Um, yes. Yes. Sure yeah. Correct right. here. Right. Okay. Well, let's uh, kick off then. Um, I've had days to present this talk because I was only asked uh, a few weeks ago. Um let me just introduce myself. Um, or not, of course, as the case may be. Let's just... Right, what's the aim of the presentation? Well, I, I, I'm really trying to promote a few questions and some discussion. Um, but I'll be talking about the current development work on the impression desktop publishing application. My cat utility... Uh, for cataloging a, a disk or a directory. Um, and the software I wrote, which is very similar internally to CAT, that converts family relationships into a family tree. So, <laughs> I've been interested in computer programming, mostly in basics. It's 1972, which was a six-form college on a time-sharing teletyper at the local College of Further Education um, in the sixth form. Um, my name's Chris Hall. I'm a chartered mechanical engineer, had a career in nuclear safety, and I'm now retired. I worked also at power stations. Um, I've used Brisk OS to publish several books. I maintain a website, and I volunteer on a heritage railway as a signalman and a signal and telegraph um, technician. Right, there's a printed set of notes and I've sent a little thing around to you all, uh, which covers a bit more detail about things that I won't say every word of, um, particularly the early history of impression. But I'll do a bit of a summary of that. Um, Everything was uh, going really nicely in the dim and distant past, in the 1990s. Um, and then it was a constant uh, catch-up game because um, the RISC PC arrived and um, theoretically able to have 32 megabytes of memory, but actually the memory was so expensive that most of them didn't. Um, the strong arm processor came out and there was a lot of code modifying. It was quite a big step that was. <coughs> because the data cache and the program cache were separated, so self-modifying code kind of didn't work. Um, also, the history was that impression had been written to be able to run in a one megabyte, which is ridiculous now, a one megabyte WIMP slot. So lots and lots of the code was about squeezing itself into a small memory footprint. Um, and in fact, as soon as the memory started expanding, um, it was quite difficult. It wasn't until 96, I think, that it could actually handle a machine with more than 20 megabytes of RAM um, because the programmers hadn't expected the data to occupy such a large space. Anyway, uh, we were fortunate, although 
Acorn computer concepts and everyone knew that 32-bit was knocking on the door. They were all quite happily whistling away at 26-bit. And uh, unfortunately, um, things started changing and computer concepts withdrew um, and started doing things on PCs after having built up quite a large user base with impression. Um, and um, fortunately, they crossed the strong arm barrier in 1996. So we were able to continue using it on RISC BC. Um, but they then took their eye off the ball, really. And uh, by about 1998, the machine that supposedly um, had the source on it didn't have a hard disk anymore. No one knew where it had gone. So um, XAT did recover what they could and started 32 bitting. And I have a little quote here from them in 2006, which says that uh, they're currently working on a, a full 32 bit in version of impression. Um, haven't decided about pricing and availability, um, but um, they'll try to repair some bugs and uh, et cetera. Uh, difficult to predict the time. And then by 2006, um, in May 2006, they said the work is commencing well, but we haven't been able to spend as much time on it as we liked. And by 2008, I think it was at one of uh, the show in the Netherlands, was it? Um, they said they were finding the task too time consuming, but they did show the main app running 32 bit. So, um, Richard Beef now started negotiating with XAT in 2011, <coughs> acquired the source uh, in May 2012. Um, and we were all surprised in February 2013 to just say so he gave a preview at one of the shows of what he'd been doing. But it was another year and a half before Impression X was on sale. Um, the sources were based on 5.10, um, just after they'd taken the code out that required a dongle for it to work, and just after they'd modified it to work on the strong arm. Um, right through the development of Impression through to Impression Publisher, um, it was fairly carefully protected and um, to preserve their income stream, but I suspect the income stream had slowed down by this time and it was no longer um, important and other software had removed protection as well. But it still needs IMU law. So um, we've inherited a large number of bugs from 5.10 that were fixed by 5.13, but the actual fixes have been lost. Um, reasonable documentation of what the bug actually is, but nothing on how it was solved, apart from the final code for 5.13. So, the roadmap. Well, we've got several things going along in parallel. We've got the 32 bitting, and that is the main application and um, the various support modules. There's correction of the bugs that have already been fixed by someone, but no one knows how. Um, there's a few new features been identified. Um, four of the five have been done. Uh, it's a mammoth task. There's a subscription scheme to support the work. Um, and then in 2019, Briscoss Developments took over the Impression X sources um, by negotiation with XAT and made Style free of charge. Now, Style is as almost as capable as Publisher, Publisher Plus, with a tiny number of exceptions, which relate to things like um, irregular frames, which I'd have to say I've never used, 
Um, and a couple of other things. Um, but Style is now free of charge, available from Pling Store. I can thoroughly recommend you trying it if you haven't tried it. iMilor is also free from um, Adrian uh, Lise's uh, website, uh, Sendiri, I think. Um, so we have an excellent product. Um, four of the five improvements that were identified have been done. Uh, they, when the first release was out, these five things were on the to-do list. However, 32-bitting of the whole package was estimated in 2006 um, at 20,000 man-hours, 2,000 man-hours for the main application. Um, and our progress so far with it is that Richard has now corrected 230 of the 800 known bugs. Um, well, one thing that I've been doing um, with Richard's um, and uh, Andrew's, uh, Andrew Rawlsley's encouragement is to replace all of the images in the user manual, which is written in impression. Um, with images that are appropriate to the impression X and modern risk OS. So all of the images in the uh, manual have had to be recaptured. Um, and to indicate quite how capable style is, only 19 of the 370 pages are actually marked in any way as saying it's impression X or publisher plus only. So the freestyle application is, is, is very capable. Um, the manual has been provided to subscribers as a PDF. You can obtain the PDF from Briscoe's development and a printed manual. And I will stop screen sharing for a moment. Printed manual. Um, does a 370 page A5 manual. Um, this is a mock up, does exist, and um, that should happen in well, that should happen um, soon. I'm quite sure why it hasn't happened. But, um, the demand is uncertain, and we haven't had shows, so it's, it's rather unfortunate because you can't turn up to a show with a great big pile of manuals and try to sell them because we haven't had the shows. Uh, I need to click again. Right. Uh, now, release five is coming out at the end of June. Um, so people who subscribed when the first version came out um, will need to subscribe for another four or five, four or five, I can't remember, updates. Although it doesn't prevent you could just continuing to use the software in its current form. Um, there's a few things going into it. Um, there's still one or two bugs with JPEG import. And I'll talk, talk a little bit about that um, for a moment. Um, Postscript duplex printing, which I haven't tried. And long file names, which I think impression was 10 character file names and then 12. And I think it's getting into the difficult territory for extending the leaf name of the file um, because of the way the code is written. Um, he also wants to be able to do a single build that will then take up a license file that you have on your machine. So you don't have to build each um, version specific to each user. Um, and an improvement to the um, artworks interface. Um, one thing that is very um, useful is that Impression will use the artworks viewer to be able to show a graphic, which means that um, the capability of artworks graphics is not limited by what impression knows about 
artworks, it uses an external um, renderer. So uh, artwork stuff will work with all the stuff in that you've put into the artworks graphic. Still requires iMular, of course. Um, and um, please subscribe now. Let, let me just say a little bit. I think the next one is... Ah, right. Let me just say a little bit about JPEG importing. Uh, importing a JPEG into Impression is awkward because its original design concept was that any, everything would effectively be held internally in the form of a sprite. Um, now, since then, sprites have had new formats. Um, the way it does it is to actually embed it in a draw file, um, which is just putting a wrapper around it. Um, so a JPEG is an unknown thing. Um, the dodge has been to load the JPEG into artworks and then load the artworks graphic into impression. And that still work, works well. <coughs> Richard is effectively making that encapsulation process invisible so that if you do drag a JPEG uh, into a graphics window, it will be wrapped up in an artworks wrapper without the user having to know. That's the way it's working, as I understand it. Um, but it's not completely um, perfect yet. Uh, one of the things I find slightly difficult is knowing whether it's seen the um, JPEG loader or not, but you get a message to say, do you want me to put this into a dithered sprite or something? And you think, ah, oh, it's not seen it. Um, so you know what to, um, to do. Um, let, let's go back to screen sharing again. And uh, one recent development, Richard's been having a lot of trouble actually reproducing the bugs that people have been reporting, mainly because people haven't been quite clear about what else was running, what platform the um, errors occurred on, and what exactly was being done. Um, well, if you think how many platforms we now have, we've got Virtual Risk PC, Titanic, um, no, I don't mean Titanic, Titanium, um, Raspberry Pi, and God knows how many different variants. So we have a lot of different ARM um, processor versions and a lot of different platforms. Um, so sometimes, and, and of course, Risk OS is being updated all the time. So some of the bugs will be related to um, um, operating system changes. Some will be related to the processor type. So unless you actually are very, very clear and specific, um, it's, it's like a little research project. Can you duplicate this bug before you even have a chance of trying to solve it? So stupidly, I've volunteered to accept the bugs, argue with the user about um, what they are and why they are and what platform and everything until I can duplicate them. And I think I've got most risk os computers, so I should be able to. Um, make them visible online so that other people can say, oh yes, I've had this too, but I found it stops if you stop using this or whatever. Um, and I'm going to help by writing a few utilities that just capture some of the data from a user's machine that says this is RISC-OS version X. It's got a, it's on a titanium platform and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so having not got very far into the timings here um, and amid some slight nervousness about, uh, about that, I, um, what about um, some questions and answers about the things that I've forgotten to mention? There is a lot of detail in the um, detailed handout, um, and I'm not proposing to read all that detail out, um, but it does talk about some of the work beyond release five, 
and uh, some of the things that happened on the way to get here. But the easiest way to probably um, um, do this is, is to say, if you've got any questions, please fire away. Uh, Chris, yeah. at the beginning of the talk, you put up the link for the PDF, and when I tried to download it, it became unavailable. Or I got a 404. Hmm, perhaps I didn't spell it correctly. Mm. Um, I mean, it looks correct, but uh, I think I typed it incorrectly, but... I was trying to listen to what you were saying at the same time. Oh, okay. Well, let me see what I can do about that. Um, it worked for me. I've just downloaded it. You've just downloaded it. It's me then. I'm the problem. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. I don't know how else to put that. I'm I knew I was the problem because my wife's but, in the next room. <laughs> that, that's the URL there on the screen. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's why I said, <clears throat> I think that's. What I sent round in the note mm. in the chat, um, but it might not be the same. But that's definitely the right one. Oh, I wonder if I wonder if uh, Firefox made that HTTPS. Well, my site doesn't do HTTPS, so that wouldn't work. I'll uh, I'll have another go later. Right ho. Yeah, I've just downloaded it finally. Yeah, it's okay here as well. Okay, it's my fault. Right, any any questions then on where, where we're going or where we've been? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in Impression X, <clears throat> I have a bug that if I have a name of a, a, a file, which is more than 12 letters, and I click on it in Impression X, it crashes the computer, and uh, I have to go back and do it in Publisher. And I've That's... This, has happened, this has been happening for years, and I've told Richard about it, but nothing seems to have happened. Well, I can assure you, it is on his list um, because I've got. Um, da, 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 da. Yeah, he's in, he's in the middle of investigating it. He um, is hoping to get that in the release at the end of June. Um, but it's file names between 12 and 16 characters that uh, give the problem at the moment. And I suspect Impression Publisher, I think, was limited to 12 or 10. Yes, 12. 12. In, in making it possible to go up to 16... He's obviously left himself with a bug with 12 character names um, and he's in the process of investigating it and he's hoping to get it sorted in the next release. Oh, that would be great. Um, that is part of his plan because okay. I spoke to him about a week ago and uh, that's what he's hoping to do. There's oh, four things you. he's trying to get in the next release. It's very frustrating to have a limit on leaf name length, but... The original idea of saving in the form of an application, which means that you are effectively limited to 10 characters by Risk OS anyway, um, because the names of applications are um, limited so that the sprite that they would imply can be shown. And sprites are limited in the number of characters, especially if you add a SM on the front to, to get the small icon. So it all made sense when it was an application-based save method. But now that you can save as a single file, clearly um, 12 characters is quite a bit of a limitation. But it, it, it unfortunately, it's pretty hard-coded all through. But he is looking into that. OK. <clears throat> Thank you very much. That's right. Right, does that, right, well, we'll um, if there are no more questions about impression, I will, if you want to unmute yourself, if you hold the space bar down 
while you're speaking, you can do it without having to find the relevant button. Chris, a quickie. Yeah. How do we find out when our subscription runs out? Yes, I thought there would be the awkward questions from some <laughs> people. Um, it's easy if you subscribe to the first uh, edition mm. in nine, when it was 2014, I because I can tell you they have just run out. Mm. Um, <laughs> if you didn't subscribe until um, a second or third release, then you should have one or two um, more releases available. Um, however, it gets quite complicated when you come to Pling Store because Pling Store does not really know about subscription models. So my understanding of the way it's going to go is that everyone will need a new subscription, but the people with some uh, updates still to come will receive a discount and that's so that there can be a season one and a season two download on Pling Store so that anyone now even if they've only just bought a um, subscription will well obviously not if they've only just bought one but if, if people have subscribed at various times and the second and third updates they will need a new um, subscription but there will be a discount on it so that, that reflects the amount of time you've got to run but the detail hasn't been published but that will enable it to work with Pling Store so that the sub second season on Pling Store will be to a fresh group of users who have upgraded either through Pling Straw or through Richard. Uh, the devil is in the detail here so we'll need to wait to hear from Andrew Rawnsley and from Richard once the detail has been sorted out. One of the key things that this relies upon is one of the things that's going to be in release five, which is enough support for cryptographic encoding of a license file so that the a download won't work unless you have a license file. Um, and that will um, enable the process to be simplified. So I have to really say on that one, just watch this space. Okay. One last question. When I spoke to Richard at the last show, uh, and he showed me a printed copy of the manual, uh, I suggested to him that it might be nice if it were uh, ready drilled with the holes that would allow it to go in the old um, the old folder that uh, came from CC. Is, uh, is that still the intention? I don't know what he said to you, but... He took it on board, but he, he didn't actually make a commitment. Excellent. Um, well, I shall certainly not give a commitment on that because in all my researches of the various print-on-demand places, um, I don't know of one that will produce it in that format. Right. So <clears throat> the, plan, um, the plan is to produce it as a perfect bound paperback, A5 size, mm. Um, which will be a standalone book. It probably would fit in the... Um, it's 370 pages, so it would probably still fit inside the yeah. file, but only just. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a bit of a squeeze. So um, <clears throat> I think it's impossible to produce it in lots of different formats. And I, I suspect it will appear as a... Uh, perfect bound paperback. Um, okay. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Um, <laughs> but right. I'll instead... speak to my local print shop and get them to uh, to cut the perfect binding off and drill the holes. Oh, you don't need to do that. You, it, it should be perfectly possible um, to take the PDF 
and just print it on A5. And a print yeah. shop will do that for not very much. Mm. And I'll cut A5 punched paper um, because the um, the cost is the scanning time. Mm. Uh, if you have a, an electronic image uh, already to be printed, then a lot of places will print it quite economically. Mm. So you should be able to print it onto A5 paper that's pre, pre-drilled. pre yeah, no, yeah, it's a good yeah. idea. That's the best way, um, yeah, honestly. Uh, um, of course, route. you'd have to buy a printed manual in order to have the relevant permissions, wouldn't you? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, I committed to that, I think. Well, OK, well, I, I don't know when that's going to happen, but uh, I think I'm probably going to be the one that um, puts it together and does it and then sends it to Richard. So um, I'm hoping that I can make some progress because it was a hell of a lot of work mm. to do the manual. Um, it was uh, capturing every single image. Given that some of the images were in a screen mode that my system didn't support, so I had to poke around with them to get them to display so I could actually work out what they were. I did have a copy of the printed manual as well. but um, And a lot of them are a combination of a sprite and lots of overlaid things like arrows in a draw file so that you've got um, an artworks file containing a draw file with bits drawn on to it. And I'm picking all of that so that you can then just put a different sprite in and have all the arrows in the same place it was possible. But of course it had to be done individually for each one. <clears throat> so I'm quite keen to see it produced because I've put a lot of work into it. <laughs> right. Um, so I'll say, watch this space. Okay, thanks, Chris. Right. Um, uh, do we have any more or shall I move on? Let me. Well, I shall move on. If you any polite questions come to you about impression, we'll take them at the end now. Um, but I'm still quite happy to answer them. Um, cat, right. Now, I was very fortunate that um, Riscos Open were happy to let me use the application name Cat. Um, there's no conflict between that and the um, um, oh, uh, uh, the uh, command line command, because they're completely different things. Um, and uh, um, I wanted to be able to, um, I'd used various methods over the past of looking at what was on a disc, all of which were rather grim and unfriendly, but I was quite keen sometimes to work out where the space on the disc had gone. Um, so I wanted to find where, where the, the huge files were residing so I could actually look at them and see if I needed them anymore. <clears throat> and if not, delete them. So I thought, well, let, let's... I think there was something, tree something or other, that was around many years ago that tried to do that, and I didn't like it. So I wrote my own. Um, I, I, I haven't really sort of polished its memory use up very much, um, because after all, if you are going to do a graphical display of files... Um, how many can you show on a screen anyway? But it uses about 1K per object. So if you do a count of the directory or disk you're trying to um, catalogue and it's got more than 500,000 objects, then CAT is going to run out of memory. Um, however, um, as I say, how many could you usefully show on a graphical display? You'd have to just... You'd have to just do a selection of directories or part of the disk or whatever. Um, it, it, it can find files anywhere. On, once it's looked at what's on the disk and tucked all the information away, you can ask it to display just the files with a particular name. Um, it can save what it finds so that you, you can load it again later on and see what was on the disk. You can look at the same disk at two different times and ask it to show what has changed. And if you want to tinker with the 
um, result, you can annotate it with all sorts of text and boxes. And I'll show you some examples of that. So, um, this is at in use now. <clears throat> because of its unfriendly memory handling, I tend to set the next WIMP slot to quite a large value. Um, doesn't matter whether it's as much as 400 megabytes, but it will accept a nice large WIMP slot, but it won't force one when it runs. Um, but if you set the next WIMP slot to a nice convenient figure, it will use that much memory. That's how the run file works. You basically set a minimum and a maximum and I've set the minimum to be something moderate, like 20 megabytes. Has to be that low in order for it to run on virtual risk PC, because you can only get 28 megabytes there. Um, but <clears throat> the maximum is 500 or so. So that's a limitation of risk OS. Uh, I have not tried to use dynamic areas, because I do know how to. Um, anyway, double click cat to get it onto the icon bar. You can see it's there on the icon bar. And then if you drag a file from a particular directory, uh, it will catalog that directory. If there are only directories in that directory, then a shift drag will have the same effect as if you dragged a file so that you can still catalog a directory, even if there aren't any files, only directories in it. Um, you see there's a couple of zip files there. They'll only be recognized as a zip file if SparkFS is running. Uh, otherwise, they'll just be a file. And that's how the operating system treats them. That's not a feature of CAT. So you, you will just get a single file um, for a zip file if, if um, SparkFS isn't running. So having dragged the um, file onto the icon bar icon, it starts listing all of the directories and objects in the root in the directory that it's trying to analyze in alphabetical order. So you can see it started with the first one there, uh, and it will continue working in the background, um, examining it, it. What it does is it looks at all of the top level files and objects in the directory, then it sorts them into alphabetical order, then it starts to process them, and it does that at each stage. Some filing systems store the data in an arbitrary order. File core filing systems store it in alphabetical order. So it makes sure that they're in the right order using arm sort, um, and it displays them as it goes through in alphabetical order, the top level. Um, and it looks at everything inside there, all the subdirectories and everything before it moves on to the next one. Um, so if it runs out of memory, it will complain. But let's, it's going through it as far as text story. Uh, and then it, the icon bar icon solidifies up and you get a display of everything in that directory arranged in order of size. Now it only knows the size just after it's looked at the directory. Once it saves it out, it doesn't bother to save individual file sizes. So at this stage, it's sorted in size order. Um, and as you can see, it's, um, you know, the largest object has got 27 megabytes in it. And it's in fact, the publisher manual and it's final version 34. Clicking on that icon for Publisher Manual 34 opens the next part of the tree below it, and that applies to the whole display all the time. So as you, you keep clicking with select, it makes more and more information display. And as you click with adjust, it makes less and less information display. Uh, and obviously, once you're trying to discuss, trying to show everything, um, a lot of it can vanish down the screen quite a long way. So let's. The next thing is to say, right? Well, I, I want to show them in alphabetical order now. So there's a menu 
that lets me do that. Um, you'll see that there are four different output formats you can use. Uh, and I've currently ticked the second one down, save as Discat. And there are various options. Um, you can truncate names on the display so that the next level down in the tree uh, knows that it doesn't have to move down out of the way. Um, you can tell it not to open image filing systems. For example, if SparkFS was loaded, um, you could tell it nevertheless not to open them and show them. Um, include sprites means you, you get a, a sprite for the file type or application type. Um, so let me move on to the next one there. So now we're in alphabetical order, and you can see you've got a tree. Uh, structure um, where all of the elements move around automatically to avoid each other. Um, now that is quite awkward to do, but it does work. <laughs> if you extend the, uh, you can extend the line that goes off to the right to move things further over out of the way and you can move things up into the gap so that you can pack things in quite neatly if you um, just move only a tiny number of them around. You can, you can use up a lot of the unused space. Um, now, at this stage, you can see that all the individual files are showing with their how many files are in the directory and what the total space used is. And that will stay, that will prevail for all the directories. But you'll notice the file, um, the files are identified in multiples of 256 bytes um, so that I can display large files. Um, if I save this and then reload it, you'll see that the individual files now show their date stamp and only the direct directories show how much is inside them. Now, if I want to, uh, let me think. Of, yes. Now, if I've taken a snapshot of a particular disk day one, and I'm now coming along taking a snapshot day 27, while I'm displaying that latest version, if I drag a previously saved contents file, disk file, shift drag it on top of the display window, it will then just show the files that have changed since that last time. So you can see some of them have just had their date stamp changed, some of them have had the contents and date stamp changed, and um, some of them have been added. Um, it only knows that the contents have changed if you select the option to calculate the cyclic redundancy check for each file, what it does is it loads the first four megabytes of each file into memory and does a CRC of that first four megabytes and stores that away so that it can tell whether a file has changed or not or whether it's just been redate stamped. Now, using the menu option find, I've typed in a file name which is simply BA. So you will see that any file name that contains the letters BA, regardless of case, is shown, even if that's halfway through the file name. So you've got a tree structure there showing you everything with BA in and, uh, uh, and nothing else. So that, if you're looking for a particular file, that can help you find it quite quickly. Here I've tinkered with um, a discat file to add some formatting commands to it, a green box around something with some text notes about what those particular files do. And that was when I was trying to describe the risk os boot structure. So those things can just be added to the beginning of a discat file. They're ignored except when displaying it as a graphic. Now, so I'll summarize that and say cat 
works in the background while you're looking at a disc. Um, the display can show what the contents of the disc. If you want to find a large object somewhere, it will arrange things so it's at the top. Uh, if you want to see what's changed since an update has given you problems, you can look at the before and after and it will just show the differences. Um, it's got its own file type allocated disk cat, which can be edited or annotated and then double click to reload it back in. So, any questions on that, please? Well, I seem to be on time. Right. Now, I was promised a question. Just, just before you, you go on to the next thing, Chris. Sorry? Um, we had a, a, a bit of mailing, didn't we? Because I said, is there a way I could make it just show and print out a text file of the titles of the file so I can make a simple index? Get rid of all the um, extraneous stuff I didn't want. Yes and no is the answer to that. If you just want a list of the file names in a particular directory and not bothered about subdirectories, then you can do it if you type star cat, which is nothing to do with my cat, yeah. you understand. Uh, open curly bracket space Fred, uh, greater than space Fred space close curly bracket. Um, it will write the list of file names out to a text file. That's just a function of the operating system. So I didn't bother to add that to CAT. What I did do was I added um, a listing similar to EX, you know, with the file name and its date stamp yep. and type. And I did one that produced an obey file, which basically said, if their file name, echo file name, and the reason I did that was it meant that I could easily edit that in to say if their file name, rename, logs or something, um, without having to sort of remember how to do some of the complicated bits. Um, but the state, just a statement of the files in a particular directory, you can do from the operating system with a very right. simple command. Hmm. Any more? Anyway, great program. Thanks very much. That's all right. I find it very useful myself. Um, I shall head off on to fan tree then. Right. I think simplest. Now, let's try and describe what I... I had a family tree um that an uncle of mine had produced in manuscript with a few annotations and i thought wouldn't it be nice if i could do a neat one of that um and so as i'd written cat i thought well, look if i arrange things so that um if john has a child there'll be a directory john and inside that will be the name of each of his children um and then just apply that to the whole family tree, I'll be able to understand what it's doing, um, edit it so that it at least has a directory for every individual. So that's the principle of the first approach to it, is that each directory is an individual um, and any subdirectories are their children. Um, very simple construct. Um, now, a husband and wife will have their own tree, so they'll exist in two places because the husband will exist on the husband's surname and the wife will exist on the wife's surname. And in principle, their tree continues below them. 
um, each of them obviously under normal circumstances having the same children, but not certainly because the uh, genealogy systems that are out there have to cater for all sorts of complications of remarriages and what have you. <clears throat> so the husband and the wife are in different boxes, um, but in most cases you'll want to put them in a single place and then show below um, the children of, of the marriage. So um, my way of approaching that is to say, yes, that's no problem, but all the directories below one of them need to be deleted because they should be the same as the directories below the other one. Um, the directory name is the Christian name of the of the child. Um, and if I just throw that at cat, but turn cat round through 90 degrees, it gives me the familiar sort of display of um, a family tree. Now, with cat, in order to move things around, you, you delve into the disk cat file and you manually edit it, adding in X and Y movements and what have you. And I thought, well, that's not going to work for this. Um, the boxes all still get out of the way of each other automatically. So that, that works. But I decided I wanted to move the boxes left and right with a mouse click so that the user isn't presented with the difficulty of remembering where he's got to add a, um, uh, a, a, a X or Y uh, addition. So I've got a very, <coughs> very intuitive method to show relationship. And when it displays on the screen, it's easy to move things around because one of the problems with a family tree is that if you lay things out in an automatic type of way, it very quickly gets very, very wide because each um, parent um, opens all the children underneath and then that's quite a wide thing so that the next parent to the right, if you like, is a lot further away. But if, of course, if you edit it and move it around, you can squeeze it up and save a lot of space. Now, as I got into this, I discovered something that I'd never heard of before. And that was something called a GEDCOM file. It's a horrible file. It really is an obnoxious format. Very, very geeky. But it allows... Um, this is the file format itself. Now, genealogy programs present it quite neatly, but the GEDCOM file itself basically says, um, this is a child of family, that one over there, um, born, died, married, etc., etc. It, it's quite a simple, very simple format. It's all text-based. And I thought that would be a great thing to be able to import it and just generate a family tree from it. So GEDCOM 5 um, file format, it will simply process it all. It throws away some of the information because one of the things with a GEDCOM file, it's designed to capture the state of the research. So tentative relationships can be included. You know, I think that's the father well, that's not a good one to choose, is it? I think I think that's the child, um, but we're not certain. And it will capture that uncertainty um, and allow you to work on it and then gradually substantiate it and improve it to definite. Um, some of that information is thrown away because, after all, you, you, you can't display a family tree that's vague. So, um, But it, most of the functions of a GEDCOM file are accommodated. So um, obviously I can't re-output it in a GEDCOM file format because that's not the purpose. The purpose of family tree is to display a family tree from various input data. Um, a GEDCOM file has a completely different purpose. It's there to support you while you're doing the research. Um, when it comes to exporting, there are some interesting opportunities here. However the data came in, whether it was from a set of files and directories or whether it was from a GEDCOM file or whatever, 
when you output it, you can output it either as a directory structure, which is a zip file. So you can write a zip file that will have all the directories in it with the detail naming and born, died, married, etc., all in there as text that would appear in boxes. Or you can output it. Now, this is quite difficult to explain, so I shall fill my cup with tea and explain. Right. Bearing in mind a similarity with CAT, one of the output formats is a disk cat file with a lot of the lines commented out so that this the cat utility if it read it in would ignore them but these are all about the text inside the boxes um so um one it's internal if you like all of the information it needs for its internal purposes can be stored in a disk cat file as the data for the internal data for the program. Um, it is a text file, which means it can be manually edited. And I'll come to why that might be interested in a moment. Obviously, it can also output in the form of the draw file, the graphic that you've produced. And there's another format, it's actual um, fam tree file type. Now, this is a draw file with a tag that surrounds the disk cat data that's contained as well in the draw file, but is not something that is displayed by anything that displays the graphics of draw files. Um, and there's enough information in it to say that the program that created this is Fantry. So, if you load the fan tree file into, for example, Impression, it will show as a draw file graphic in Impression. But if you control double click it, it will open fan tree for you to edit and move the boxes around. And then if you save the result back into Impression, it simply updates the draw file graphic with the edits that you've just done. So that's a neat way to have all of the internal detail as well as the actual graphic layout of the file you've produced. Now, let me say why that's useful. Each of the different formats has different things when it comes to editing. You've got a lot of text, names, surnames, dates of birth and such like inside the boxes. When you save it out as a disk cat file, that information is held just underneath the relevant directory name um, with a line beginning with a comment, um, a vertical bar. It, it's a way of editing the text that's inside the boxes in a single document so that you can have a list of the edits you want to do and, and, and make those edits directly. At the moment, it does not understand um, Unicode. Um, so if you've got an accent character, it will have a two character representation for it that probably needs editing. Now I'm going to work on that in a later update, he said foolishly. Um, in fan tree format, you can load it as a graphic and, and use OLE to edit it. And if you do it as a directory structure, it means that if you've got a paternal and maternal parts of a tree, you can move them around, simply moving the directory from the father's um, directory to the mother's directory will move the whole lot in one go, for example. And if you want the children displayed other than in alphabetical order, if you change the name of the directory so that they're sorted in the way you want them, um, but leave the detail of their name the same so they'll appear the same on the screen in the box. You can list them in whatever order you want to list them. Um, and the GEDCOM format is very good in other software while you're still doing the research. 
it's quite a bundle of information. So, moving boxes around on the screen, you see there are two family trees here, Jones and Smith. Um, the Jones tree um, has Mary Jones um, in the third box from the left. Um, <clears throat> And you'll see that Mary Smith has married John Montmorency. Um, yes, it's a shame, really. Ah, yes, right. So, if I get this right, yes, you'll see that Mary Jones in in the Jones tree. Mary Jones has married Alan Montmorency, and there are children, Alan and blank box which was John. Um, I've made the box invisible by uh, a little bit of sleight of hand. Um, normally there'd be a box there that said John Montmorency but um, it, you'll notice Mary Smith has married John Montmorency so by moving boxes around on the screen I can bring that box that says Mary Smith equals John Montmorency down and left until it is just underneath that line that doesn't go anywhere. <clears throat> so that the two family trees have then been brought together um, so that William Montmorency will then appear on both the Smith and the Jones family trees um, and can continue on. So a select click where the green arrow is pointing we'll move all of the boxes in the red dotted line to the left. So that instead of the um, tree coming down under Alan Jones and extending to the right, it will extend to both left and right. And the boxes will all move together. And the Smith tree will move left to fill in the gap automatically. You don't have to move that. That will notice that there's free space and will move over. Click adjust to move right. And if you shift click, you can extend the line that extends below the relevant box um, to lengthen it or contract it. So you start with something that is just a tree-like view of the directories on the disk. Uh, you can add a lot of the detail of what's in the box by tinkering with the disk cap file. Um, there's also you can put the information in a text file in the relevant directory. Um, and um, here you can see this has taken very little time to put, put, to put that structure together. It's very simple to do. I think that's the point, that a directory and the Christian names of all the children and then their children is actually something that's very quick to do. Obviously, if you've got a GEGCOM file, then you simply import that. So it's as simple as that. Um, it doesn't use proportional fonts at the moment, which I'm a bit embarrassed about, but that is on the list for the next version. Um, it's very easy to use um, monospace uh, text because you don't have to think when you format it. You know how wide it's going to be just by counting the characters. Um, but that is on the to-do list. So. Um, far away with any questions. Ooh. I've stuck to my timetable pretty well. I think you've stunned everyone, Chris. Yes, I'm, uh, um, it, it, it's surprisingly simple to put together the family relationships just by using directories to contain children. It, it, it actually is very quick um, because I, I, I basically translated the um, uh, family, tr the manuscript family tree just by sort of creating the directories. And, and of course, it's so easy to see what the thing when, when it gets difficult is when you're several, you get a family who reuses particular Christian names a lot. 
because that went on a lot in the uh, sort of 18 and 1900s. Um, oh, I'll name my children after my grandfather or whatever. Um, so that you can get a little bit confused when you're about three or four directories in and you're thinking, oh, God, it's another John. Which one's this? Um, but having said that, it's actually quite straightforward to just add the various children and what have you. And you can very quickly get a, a family tree display. Um, you think, yeah, that's almost there. I just need to add some detail. So it, it is quite an intuitive way to do it. A GEDCOM file, of course, relies on you having some genealogy software and inputting all the information in the way that those programs work and producing that as the result. And you can just then import it into um, FamTree. So it's best to restart FamTree each time you import new data um, for reasons which I'm embarrassed about because it doesn't quite completely forget what was there before for reasons which I haven't yet found out. But having said that, it's really quite straightforward to import the file and then tinker with the boxes. I've, I've had some sales, a pitifully small number, of course, because our platform is not really as big as it used to be. But uh, I have had some sales through Pling Store and at the various shows, so I'm quite pleased about that. I'm also um, keen to get any requests from users. There have been one or two um, because I can probably accommodate them. Um, so uh, it's over to you, really. Any more any more questions on any of the things I've, I've said this evening? Yeah, Chris, there's one um, question I've got on um, CAT. Um, I look after um, Sitematch, which does quite a few of the same things, but aimed at websites, obviously. Um, but how, how do you get your site icons? Because in Sitematch, it's a, it's an, a sprites file with them all in. And, I would like to get them from the system. Ah, right. Well, um, there is a mixture. Let me try and remember. Um, there is a sprite file with a lot of them in, inside cat. Um, now, um, let me try and... When it looks at the directory... It knows the file type of the file, so it will see if there is a sprite defined for that file type. It knows the application name, and it will see if there is a sprite um, registered for that application name. But that relies on the filer having seen the relevant resource. Mm -hmm. There are also a number of... Um, particularly file type um, icons that I have um, put inside cat as I already know them, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. The reason I've done that is that when you're cataloging a disk, you might be looking from the top directory. And a lot of the windows may not have been opened by the filer, so that the boot files won't have fired off and they won't have registered their icon sprites. So the reason I've put a lot of the file type icons in is that they still show as the correct file type, even though that file type hasn't yet been seen. But I can't do that for application names in any um, great way. So the application names will have the standard default application icon um, if they haven't been seen. While the display is active, while it's still displaying what is in the disk, and before you save it, if you do um, happen to open a, an application or, or a file type um, that it hasn't before known, the display will just update because that now is... Um, so, so basically what the logic says is, um, you know, if 
that file type icon doesn't exist, then display the standard question mark. <clears throat> um, once you save the information, um, it generates a much larger draw file. Let me just say what it's doing. While you're displaying the active contents of a disk, each different um, icon sprite is only held once. It has a lookup table. So if you've got loads and loads and loads of text file names, while it's displaying on screen, it only holds that in one place, and each time it comes across it, mm -hmm. it uses it. So it doesn't one. use the standard operating system rendering to display the draw file in the window. Mm -hmm. It looks up each different one from a lookup table. When you come to save the file, either as a draw file or as a discat file, um, then it saves the information that it knows about um, so that you'll have the question mark one saved at that point and it won't then try looking it up again. So it's a mixture really of, of two things, a sprite file with lots of the file types um, that um, are known and whatever is there on the fly when it's looking at the disk. Okay, thank you. That was uh, answers why why it hasn't been done that um, that way before. Because uh, yeah, it would be non-trivial to uh, to alter it. <laughs> Any more questions? <clears throat> Everybody's stunned. <laughs> Chris, um, uh, is, does Fam Tree cost money? I can't, I know free with Fam Tree. Uh, uh, yes, um, Chris. I, um, it's available as a demonstration, and I can't remember what it doesn't do. I think it doesn't allow you to save anything, but um, you can download it as a demo from Pling Store. Um, um, and yes, I did more as an experiment, really. Um, it, I think it's fifteen pounds. I, 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 I bought two hundred pen drives with it preloaded, um, and have sold an embarrassingly small number of them. Um, and of course, we haven't had shows for a while. Um, and I, my prospects of selling any more of them look vanishingly small. So it is possible at some point I will um, make it available for nothing because it's not actually a, an income stream that's particularly sensible at the moment. So watch this space. I might, of course, if I do make it available for nothing, then I, I'll be quite happy to ignore any user requests for enhancements. <laughs> But I'm thinking about that, yes. And the market is simply not worth charging for it, really. It just only did it because Pling Store allows me to do it. And very occasionally I'll get a, a, a small amount of money from Andrew as, as people purchase it. But that's kind of dried up now. Okay, well, thanks for that. That's all right. Um, Yes. Oh, uh, when's the uh, May issue of the magazine coming out? Sorry? When's the May? When, when's the May issue of your magazine coming out? Uh, as soon as Steve Wright gets you finished. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that would probably be the answer. And if I look forward to that. So. He's uh, also, um, because uh, he's also involved with uh, amateur theatre, so uh, he had to split his time between that and the club. Yes, sort of absolutely. Time. Oh, I'm not, it's not a complaint. It's just uh, um, Archive now is coming out more regularly, which is an extremely welcome step. Um, and uh, that that's uh, quite a good thing because they were getting so further and further apart and uh, 
but now they seem to be running roughly on time. It's excellent. But, uh, well, any any more questions about anything? Um, you might find that the detailed notes that you can download actually um, answer some questions anyway. I didn't read out all of the detail, um, but I'm quite pleased to see that I've managed to stick to my program pretty much. I have indeed. Thank you very much. <laughs> Doesn't seem to be a way to get. Yeah, so uh, uh, yes, I'm quite pleased about that. Considering I uh, made it up without any rehearsal <laughs> whatsoever, I'm, I'm quite pleased that that's worked. Um, yeah, well, any questions, find me an email and I'll try and answer them. Um, and uh, if I turn the screen share off. Yeah, so. We're now into back. chat mode. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, it's been very interesting. Surely somebody must have some more questions out there. <laughs> How many people have we got? At least I don't. About 20. 21. 21 people. Hmm. Oh, what have I done there? Hmm. Yes, I like all the virtual backgrounds. Particularly like the floating microphone, Ruth. How does the microphone float? <laughs> ah, yeah. ah, right. Okay, that vanishes as you move away. Yes, That's cunning. Cool. Yeah, the background is actually a recreation of the original. BBC a Radiophonic Workshop. Oh, brilliant! Yes, it uh, looked uh, it, it looked a little uh, photographed a at a Doctor Who exhibition I went to a few years ago, where they recreated the original BBC Radiophonic Workshop, where the Doctor Who theme tune was uh, created. Of course, yes, so, good old days. I'm afraid where you could spend know, whatever time you, know, you needed on what you wanted to do. Mm. Sorry, Chris, what was that? Well, it was the good old days when uh, the BBC had resources and people were allowed to do the th things they needed to do without the management leaning on them too much. There wasn't money floating around, but it was amazing what people could do for shoestring. There was a very interesting uh, programme on a couple of weeks ago about Delia Derbyshire. Um, she was the the genius really that put that um music together it wasn't written by her it was written by um ron grainer mm. but uh, it was delia derbyshire that actually realized it and um and created it all created all the wonderful weird and wonderful sounds oh yes yeah, yeah wasn't there a story that uh, ron grainer was absolutely amazed at what she'd managed to do as a result the story is that he listened to it and said, did I write that? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, well, most of it. <laughs> sort of. I think he wrote it on the back of a serviette or something, handed it to Delia, and she went away and did all the clever stuff. Brilliant. Apparently the tape was leaving the um, leaving the spool of the uh, tape. Well, one of the tapes was leaving the spool of the tape recorder. Um Travelling out of the radiophonic workshop door, around the microphone stand, down a corridor, round another microphone stand, back up the corridor, round another microphone stand, and back onto the take-up spool of the of a, of a different recorder, just to get the loops the right length for it to. Oh, good lord! Yes. I know. Because at that time, if you had several cameras um, connected. You had to make sure the lengths of the cables were right, so the delay of the signal were all consistent. So when you mixed it all together, you got everything was still together, if you like. And uh, yes, it's a different era, really. It, 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 people have got it so easy with all this digital stuff now. Hmm. Definitely is.
inquire over there. Presumably you're hoping to have a, a show next year in Wakefield. We have a date booked already for next year. Good, good. 23rd of April, I believe it is. Oh, I'm sure it'll be in my diary. Um, and uh, <coughs> I do look forward to actually meeting up. If the, You know, um, it's so different. Um, I mean, I was really pleased I went to the Southwest show in February 2020, because that was the last show we had for a long time. Um, well, we don't know how long yet. Um, and uh, um, there weren't that many people there, but I think if they'd known that there was going to be a lockdown coming up, the place would have been crowded. But, uh, um, but it was recorded so people could watch it remotely. Um, and I suspect that there'll be a lot a mixture now of real shows and remote shows that we'll find rather puzzling. Yes, but, uh, um, it's it's one of the it's an interesting um, topic that the, the the lockdown that's forced everybody to use things like Zoom and Skype and goodness knows what else. Um, it it really opens up lots of opportunities for um, different ways of holding meetings and different ways of. Uh, you know, we could have a, some sort of composite meeting that's, uh, you know, where we have a, a live meeting, but with a guest joining us over Zoom or uh, things like that. So, yeah, lots of lots of opportunities ahead, I think. Well, that's true, provided that the people who run Zoom don't suddenly see it as a money making opportunity and cut right down on what you can do for free, because at the moment, a meeting of the size we've just had, I don't think you trip over any particular barriers. Whereas if you start to want more than 100 people or whatever, you start having to pay and such like. And I think that might. Oh, you have to pay um, any anything over um, two people for anything more. Two, two people can chat practically forever. Mm. But as soon as it becomes more than two, then you're immediately into either a 40 minute limit, which is obviously very limiting, mm. um, or you pay, I think it's about is it 12 pounds a month, something like that. You get a, a, a pro license and then you're into the territory that we're using now. So uh, <laughs> we, can, we could have up to a, a hundred and odd people, um, but with realistically unlimited uh, amount of time online. That explains why one particular museum was doing film shows that lasted approximately 40 minutes <laughs> and then restarted. Yeah, you can actually, if you get thrown off after 40 minutes, you can rejoin the same meeting again. Yeah, yeah I was yeah, doing that, that for a while. I, I, teach, a, <laughs> yes. I teach a group of um, um, re retirees um, on Tuesday mornings get, get, you know, with basic IT stuff and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and for a while, I was doing the same thing. We were having a 40-minute session and then a five-minute tea break, tea break, in inverted <laughs> commas, and then another 40-minute session. And mm -hmm. it worked fine, but mm -hmm. it just became a little bit Tedious, yeah. limiting because every time you start a 40-minute session, especially with some of the silver surface, shall I say, <laughs> Um, that uh, the first five minutes is uh, is very much sort of um, um, is is my microphone on again? Is it, is it, is it working? You know, you've got it's immediately cut down from a, a forty minute session to a, uh, a thirty three minute mm. session or something like that. So, um, but so I've I've splashed out on the pro license, so it's it's worth mm. having to say twelve or thirteen pounds a month, something like that, and it's. If the host sets up the meeting as an ongoing meeting, you can sign in again with exactly the same details. If you've just done it as a single 40 minute, then you have to have a new um, login code, et cetera, et cetera. Ah, oh, right. I see. Yes. Well, that, that's probably a fairly gentle um, payment method, payment system that allows you to do certain things for nothing, like chat to one person. Uh, that's probably quite sensible. 
Um, let's just hope they don't get greedy. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Uh, Zoom are bringing out or plan to launch something called Zoom Events, which is sort of uh, apparently, according to the article I was reading this morning, is going to be a like now Zoom meeting, but you can also have it in, say, a club meeting or something. So it's a hybrid between a totally Zoom meeting and an in-person meeting. Mm. So uh, uh, people coming out of lockdown, there can be more of that going on. Yes, I think um, one of the things BT did at the beginning of the lockdown was to cap call charges at um, £5, a, five, £5 a pounds a month. Um, but they didn't advertise it very well, and after a few months, they stopped doing it. And uh, um, it was a very, very welcome thing for them to do to recognise that you know people were needing to use the phone more. Um, but for some very strange reason, they didn't publicise it at all. So it was quite some time before I found out. But um, that sort of thing has been incredibly helpful during the lockdown. The ability for people who've never used things like this before to use things like Zoom and, and people who speak on the telephone without being ripped off. Um, and, uh, of course, the telephone system is going over to voice over IP. Some, in fact, people with fibre to the premises have already been ruthlessly forced onto it. Oh. Right. Well, it's all gone very quiet now, so Yes. You're very dark in your room there, Chris. <laughs> uh, the ambient light has um started fading. If I put the light on, you'll find it's worse. Oh wait. <laughs> No, I don't know, though. Well, perhaps that's better. Fantastic, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. surprising. I, I uh, was teaching a, a session a few weeks ago, and uh, one, one of the sessions was making the most of Zoom um, and... You know, I, I just—I mean, I'm not—I'm not setting a good example at the moment, but um, but we went through uh, the difference—the uh, difference to your presentation by using different cameras and by using a different microphone or um, lighting different backdrops, whether you're using a green screen or just the the magical AI artificial thing like this. <laughs> you can see my real, but you can see my real office behind if I move. Mm. Back, you know. Yes, there you go. Well, my my uh, computer complains that it's uh, not fast enough to do a virtual background. Um, it doesn't work very well at all because I haven't got a green screen behind me. Um, and uh, my process is too slow on this desk, mm. on this portable, for it to be able to cope with having to do the processing of working out what's me and what's the background. This is what so. I was trying to explain to some of, some of our... Um our people that um you know just just because i can do it on my computer here which is a i7 16 gig of ram fast mm. solid state drive blah 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 you know that they, they think they should be able to do it on their um you know um, six, 60 quid tablet from tesco's or whatever it is <laughs> I to explain to them that yeah. it doesn't quite work that way Processing power. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. People don't realise, you know, when they say they come to me for advice and they say, "Oh, I just, I'd, I'd want to buy a computer. What should I buy? Well, what do you want to do with it? Oh, ju nothing much. Just a bit <laughs> of um, web browsing and watching some movies. Um, and I might want to edit up some videos that I took on holiday. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Whereas it used to be, I just want to do a bit of word processing and access the internet, and you can need a really basic computer to do that. But now people have got all these clever ideas.
The other thing is that about everybody's uh, expected uh, to have a smartphone uh, nowadays. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Well, I went to a pub the other day and uh, I said, have you got a menu, please? And they said, no, um, you'll need an app. So I said, oh, well, could you bring me an app, then, please? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, they did. <laughs> I mean, in fairness, it's, it's quite surprising what things you can do on a smartphone. I'm getting an echo again. Uh, it's amazing what you can do on a, something like a smartphone or a tablet. Um, well, you can queue jump in weather spoons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Only if you get spitting enough to go to a weather spoon. Yeah. <laughs> corollary to that is okay. Corollary is okay. An acquaintance of ours <laughs> rang up the doctor and they said, given she's 91, and they said, well, we could do uh, one of these uh, phone conversations with you. Just take a picture of the area and she, with your phone. And the woman said, what do you mean? Given that she's had a landline since 1954. <laughs> the, the woman at the doctor said, well, on your smartphone. And the 91-year-old said, what's that? And so you can see there are an awful lot of people uh, quite caught up with the technology who are missing out. Mm. Uh, one of the other really useful things that I'm finding Zoom um, well, I'll, I'll rephrase that the other thing I'm finding Zoom really useful for um, is um, one to one tutorials because you can use Zoom to take control of someone else's computer it's a bit like using um, any desk or um, what's the other one, team viewer um, it's not quite as responsive as any desk or team viewer but you can do it, and it also means mm. that you can talk um, and see each other at the same time and still take control of someone else's computer. So um, mm. if somebody's got a problem and I don't know how to do so-and-so, right, okay, I'll take control of your mouse and I'll show you what buttons to click and um, mm -hmm. and things like that, and they find that yes. very useful. So yeah. All you need to do now is to type in the password for your bank account. Yeah, that's excellent. No. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Yes. Bermuda, <laughs> here I come. Yeah. Microsoft are a bit fed up with Zoom. They keep promulgating Skype as an alternative. <laughs> well, Skype used to be good until Microsoft got hold of it. Oh, good Lord, have they got hold of Skype? <laughs> yeah, they bought it about, oh, it must be about 10 years ago now. Up until then, it, Skype was quite good. And um, it was produced in... Was it Scandinavia or, or Eastern Europe? I forget. Um, but, um, was, yeah, a couple of individuals produced it um, and then and then Microsoft saw it and thought, oh, we could do with that. So they bought it <laughs> and it was downhill ever since. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, Teams is the Microsoft product, isn't it, that tries to hmm. do what Zoom does. And we were trying to use Teams for a, an annual general meeting of our society um, with the complicating factor that one of the, the speaker was profoundly deaf and needed to lip read or to have subtitles. And Teams just couldn't do it. You had to pay an extra fee to have subtitles and they wouldn't work. And Microsoft even got a Microsoft technician involved and he couldn't fix it. So we went to Zoom in the end, and that seemed to work quite nicely. Mm. Yeah, that's the way it should be. I mean, but going back to Skype, I had it on my smart TV for a while um, and got the little camera and um, microphone that you can stick on top of the TV, um, and then they discontinued it. <laughs> mm. I have to use a computer or a phone. Well, I think... Things are going to change when the telephone system goes over to voice over IP because all of their charging models will start to look rather strange because um, date, basically data transfer is very cheap. And once people know that that's how you can do a phone call, I can't see how they're going to keep up with call charges, but uh, most people are on a package anyway. 
Yeah, my package doesn't include any uh, landline phone calls anymore because I don't use it. I've always got my yeah, my, same here. Uh, yeah. phone at the side of me. So, um, the, you know, this, this I've got like a couple of friends that always call me on the landline. Other than that, it's it never gets used. So. Well, my sister tells me I'm the only person who rings her landline, and the only reason I haven't um, used the mobile phone more is that I can't get a signal inside my flat, so it's useless. So, um, you know, I'll have a, someone will ring me up and I'll speak to them, and after about mm-hmm. half a minute, it just breaks up and dies, so it's useless. <laughs> And it's very difficult to convey that to people and saying, well, if I'm at home, ring me on my landline, but if I'm not at home, ring me on my mobile. But, hmm. Yeah, I find that about 90% of my calls on the landline are scammers. Um, and I just let them go to, to voicemail and they invariably hang up. I put some nice uh, loud queen music on my hi-fi and dangled the receiver over <laughs> <on> my speakers. <laughs> yeah. um, Richard, I'm just nosing um, your microphone that you got there. Is it an Audio Technica by any chance? No, it's an AKG. It's I've got a problem with with the um, I'm using an iMac and it's got a audio um, an analog output for the headphones, but hasn't got an an analog input for the microphone. So I've got to use a USB mic, and this is just a Perfection 120, I think. Yep, sounds nice and clear. But the, one of the problems with um, Zoom is I don't get a feedback from the mic into the into the can, so I can't tell whether it's overloading or not. You you could do a trick with OBS, um, so you could put your feed your microphone and your webcam in, webcam into OBS. You can monitor out from OBS, but also feed the output uh, from um, OBS back into Skype. Uh, sorry, back into <laughs> Zoom as. Uh, as a pretend webcam, virtual oh, webcam. Yeah. It's a bit of a cheat, but, <laughs> you know, you can do it if you really, really do. <laughs> so where are we on to now? Well, it's 23 minutes past nine. So um, I think that sort of drawn things to a, a close. Uh, anybody else want to have a chat about anything else, or shall we? Uh, shall we? Shall we call it call it quits at this? <laughs> I've I've got to be up early anyway because uh, I've got some I've got some damn students to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank Chris for uh, a very interesting talk tonight. And thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Right. Yes, indeed, and uh, <laughs> very very well timed. <laughs> Yeah. I look forward to developments on uh, impression, particularly. Yes. Um, so, so am I. Yeah. All right. <laughs> all right. That's lovely. So, thank you, everybody, and um, we shall see you all again very soon. We will see you. It's not like television where they say, <laughs> "I'll see you soon," because I have to say, "No, television doesn't work that way." But <laughs> anyway, we will see each other again. So that's really nice. So thank you for joining us, and good night, everybody. Okay. Good night. Bye. Okay. <laughs>